you too can feel this zen by using the join button where I'm currently teasing future videos. Also, have you heard of this graph? Most people are subscribed? That's not good. Since Riot Games has been active for over 12 years now, it comes to no surprise that they had a chance to forge quite a few stories of their own. Be it the good ones, the great ones, the bad ones, or the really bad ones. In most cases, people quickly learn about what is going on. From the minor things, some people will remember that one time people were able to buy loot boxes for one blue essence. For those of you who don't know League, that's essentially for free. This mistake stayed up in the store for only 10 minutes. But because nobody really checks the prices of loot boxes, only about 50 people globally noticed it and they bought all the skins to cap off their accounts. And because it wasn't a glitch, it was a legitimate mistake on Riot's part, Riot let those players keep all the skins. Which made everyone who didn't buy all the skins really mad. Over the years, Riot gathered quite a few of these stories. But only a few months ago, by a pure coincidence, I learned about something that used to be quite a big part of the League creator scene. There was a time when it was absolutely everywhere. And because it was so widespread, nobody paused to think about it. And apparently, the truth, my friends, is... It is not all sunshine and rainbows, because... Get to the fucking point! During the great height of the League creator scene, many League creators were sponsored by two companies. The first one that started a bit of fire of its own was... WT Fast. This was a company that claimed to optimize gaming networks, which I think it still does to this day. In other words, it claimed to lower your ping. After WT Fast sponsorship started appearing in nearly every League video, some people decided to look into it. And they realized this app only really works under very specific circumstances. Because it was simply rerouting your connection, the app checked all possible paths and it picked the one with the lowest ping. However, if you simply happen to live in a bad place with realistically only one workable path, the app literally did nothing for you. And so, some people started calling the creators out, saying that they promoted a scam and that the app doesn't work. The funny thing about this is that WT Fast was essentially a VPN before VPNs became big. So would the same creators be sponsored by them now? It would be no different from being sponsored by NordVPN, which are also in every video these days. But because back then they mainly advertised low ping instead of the ability to bypass region locks, it started a bit of drama in League's community. But that wasn't the only time sponsorships got spicy. There is also the second time something like this happened. But that one is a lot more interesting because to this day, most people still don't know what was really happening including the creators themselves. And very quickly, before I dive into this, I'll show some screenshots and footage on screen, but I am not calling anyone out. Nobody knew what was happening. So we are not talking about people promoting a scam. To be honest, back then I would have taken the sponsor too. And at the end of the day, as you'll see, it's just funny that any of this happened in the first place. Just move on already. As I said, I learned about this by a coincidence. My source of information wanted to stay anonymous, so I will honor that request and I will hide their identity. So when I learned what was happening, it went something like this. Hey, remember that time you could buy some of the unavailable skins from the resellers? Yeah, they're yoing the codes from Riot that made the orchestrators a lot of money. Those of you who are nearing your 30s may remember that back in the day, a lot of people were sponsored by shops that were selling skins. Originally, in this video, I wanted to mention some of the shops specifically. But I don't know what they would do, so I am not naming anyone. By pure technicality, I can't prove they did anything. But you can guess who I'm talking about. Anyway, these websites were simple resellers of skins who mainly focused on selling skins that were not available in League anymore. And they tried to sponsor absolutely every creator. And I really mean every creator. 
besides me. You see, 7 years ago, when everyone was riding the League gameplay hype train, I was the awkward guy in the side lane talking about lore. Some people knew I existed, but I definitely wasn't what you would call mainstream. So even though I rarely wanted to be sponsored and I rarely wanted that Pax Jack skin, I was never considered for a sponsorship. Oh, speaking of which, let's talk about how they could afford all the sponsorships. You see, because this was a skin reseller dealing with skin codes, what they could do is offer creators skins instead of money. And you bet that's all they needed to get hooked up. Because this was happening during League's great height, a lot of people would do anything for those juicy pack skins. What? You don't think that would happen today? You don't think kids would rob a bank for a few Roblox bucks? You're right, but they considered it. So yes, in a lot of cases, people were paid in skins instead of real money. To be honest, that's not the worst thing to get paid in. So let's talk about where those skins came from. While these days the craze is all about rioters giving away gun buddies and riot wards. Back in the day, all the special goodies were given away in the form of codes printed on physical cards. These were usually given away during special gaming events, namely PAX and Gamescom. Gamescom used to be very special to Riot. Not only was that where the very first League Championship ever happened, but that's also where Riot used to tease some of their champions, for example Syndra and Rengar. So, that's also where Riot gave away exclusive skins. Which means skins you couldn't get anywhere else. The first year, if you attended one of these events, you could get Pax Twisted Fate. The year after that, you could get Pax Jax. And the year after that, you could get Pax Sivir. The following years, Riot recognized that people weren't massive fans of this kind of exclusivity. So after that, people got codes for Riot Blitzcrank and Arcade, Sona and Hecarim. All of which were skins that were also available in the normal store. Now, because the old pack skins were exclusive and because we assume they were printed in limited quantity, of course, these skins were in high demand. And people were ready to buy them off of those who attended the events. Which means that in one way or another, all the cards that were not given away during these events ended up in the hands of the resellers. At least, that's what we thought was happening. You see, getting the cards through a shady practice and selling them on the internet? That would be fine, it's like selling anything old on eBay. But eventually, you would run out of physical cards to sell, so you would hit a ceiling. That's why, for the longest time, Riot didn't do anything about it. There was a clear limit. But somehow, these websites just kept on running. And as it turns out, they could keep on running for as long as they wanted. Because they figured out how to generate the codes themselves. Yeah, we don't really have the details anymore, but apparently it wasn't that hard. Essentially, the codes operated on a formula. For example, let's say the third letter always had to be a C. The fifth letter always had to be an H. And the last one would always have to be number 6. Anything in between didn't matter. As long as you had these three symbols in the code, the system would recognize this as a silver skin. Now, of course, there was a limitation. Each combination of letters could only be added into the system once. The thing is, because these were 12 digit long codes, they could virtually print out an infinite amount. The possible supply would be massively bigger than the demand. This also makes it funny when the websites mentioned that something was not in stock. But in 12 hours they will totally get you a new physical card. Knowing this is how the resellers operated, it now absolutely makes sense how they could afford all the sponsorships. Because some people got paid in skins, which they could generate for free, they got all the promotions for free. Was it all illegal? I don't know. Would I get chased down if someone figured out that I bought one of these skins? Probably not. At least I hope so. It says here you were caught in possession of illegally attained JPEGs. Is this about the NFTs I keep hearing about? 
No, sir, it was Bags Jack's skins. Hmm. Death. The crazy thing is that the creators never learned about any of this. In the eyes of the creators and the customers, it was all legitimate codes from the events. But also, if you actually look into what was happening, it wasn't a scam. Generating new codes was no different from a kid who goes to Steam and types in a random number to see if they can unlock a random game. Let's be honest, we have all tried that in our lives. And sure, even if you get lucky, I don't think anyone would call it a scam. Also, Riot never planned on distributing these skins further. They never planned to sell the skins themselves. So the resellers didn't even bite into Riot's profits. So what they have really done is given the skins to more people than what was intended. So because the customers legitimately got their skins, and because the creators got free skins to enjoy too, nobody got harmed. And the only one who might have gotten harmed was Riot. That is if Riot ever decided to sell the skins themselves, which they didn't. Also, if the internet taught me anything, it is that if a corporation gets harmed, nobody cares, it's fine. But even if we can't call it a scam, I think we can all agree that it was unethical to sell the skins. But you see, we didn't even get to the funny part. There wasn't just one website that did this. Apparently, there were multiple people who figured out how the codes work. And they all started their own skin shops. Of course, all the shops knew about each other, which is why they all tried to have similar prices. There was no point in undercutting each other because that would only burn everything down. However, because there were multiple shops generating these codes, occasionally one shop would generate a code that was used by someone else. At that point, if the customer told you that their code didn't work, you had no way to check if they were bluffing. And you automatically had to concede into giving them another code. Which you did for free. Now because all the shops knew about each other and they knew what they were doing wasn't exactly ethical, to a certain degree they worked together to keep it low and to stay away from Riot's prying eyes. But the profits were too big. The temptation too great. I mean, we are not talking about 10 or 20 dollar skins. These special skins went for 100, 400 or even a thousand dollars. Which, by the way, all the prices were made up because there was no supply. So yeah, the resellers absolutely wanted to maximize their profits. Now, up to this point, as far as I know, all the shops agreed to not do any sponsors and to not buy any ads. That would expose them to riot. But that twisted fate was 400 euros. So one of them had an idea. Since we are aiming at League of Legends players who spend most of their time watching League of Legends videos on YouTube, what if I tell them to promote my shop in their videos? And that's exactly what they did. And the first skin giveaways started rolling out. That was the point of no return. And the moment one shop went rogue, everyone else did as well. And everyone quickly started sponsoring everyone and they started advertising everywhere. It was all gas, no brakes, because it was only a matter of time before Riot figured out what was really happening. And indeed, it wasn't long before Riot realized, huh, there is no way they have that many physical cards. And that's how Riot ultimately found out what was happening. In the end, it was greed that shut down the exclusive skin black market. And in 2014, Riot decided to deactivate the system that was claiming the legacy skin codes. And I think it's safe to assume these people probably made a lot of money in the days before it shut down. Reportedly, I have heard some of them might have gotten close to a million dollars. Now, I should also mention that there is a chance that some of them might have been legitimate shops. I mean, as legit as scalpers and resellers can be. They were just reselling physical cards. But the vast majority of them figured out how Riot's code system worked. Now, as to where those websites ended up, no one can be sure. But there are some who stayed resolute. Some who decided to keep rolling with their internet businesses. Some who even kept their business around League. 
And ultimately, Google doesn't consider them a safe website. Why, you ask? Well, also some of them keep selling accounts with those skins unlocked, which seems very suspicious. 